Tom here from Lauren Systems. Back in 2019, I had reviewed some cables, which led to a lot of questions with these little thin cables that I didn't have the answers to. But Dan Barrera did, and me and him did a video. Now, Dan works for Ideal Networks, and Dan sits on the standards board and is part of the committees that, well, help ratify these cable standards, has a very in-depth knowledge, of course, of all of these topics, and I'll leave a link to the video we did before. In this video, we kind of bring around some of the new and upcoming cable standards and why you might need to buy a new cable certifier in order to well, comply with these new standards that are coming out, even kind of retroactively against existing cables. There's a lot of details in it. We're going to dive into some of the engineering behind it and also talk about some new things coming out like single pair Ethernet and what that means, including single pair PoE. It's kind of another standards coming out uh, for a very specific use case. And we dive into details of that too. Uh, so if you're interested in all those things, you're ready to get deep into weeds, let's get started. Tom here from Warren Systems, and I'm here with Dan Barrera, and welcome, Dan, again. <laughs> Hi, Tom. It's good to be back. Yeah, uh, we did a video together diving into how the cabling standards are made, some of the finer details of that. That was a lot of fun. That was pushing not quite two years ago, I think we did that video. Yeah. A year, year and a half. Um, I will leave a link down below to that video. This is a, an update, though. Is uh, We already covered how the cabling standards are made, so now let's cover what the new ones that are coming out and some new, especially when you said single pair ethernet, that's uh, that's interesting. We also have resistance and unbalance and how TCL, we're gonna get in some deep details on electrical here. Yeah, there's, there's kind of three topics I wanted to discuss with you and your audience here um, that were three things we're working on uh, in both TIA and ISO. So these are international uh, developments. So one is, um, as you mentioned, single pair ethernet. Uh, the other is resistance unbalance. And then the third would be TCL and ELTCL. So um, the resistance unbalance and TCL are measurements that we do on cabling. And uh, I think the primary thing that I wanted to talk to you and your audience about is that we are doing something that I think is fairly unprecedented in standards, which is making a, a measurement um, retroactive. So typically, you know, when we come out with a new grade of cabling, and I'll use CAT8 as the latest example. Um, so we uh, have CAT8 cabling, and with that, we included some new measurements, resistance and balance and TCL, um, those two. And I'll explain what those are, but because those were new measurements and it's a new category of cabling, you you know it makes sense. Okay, these are some things we need to do for this cabling. But what you we'd never done in the past is say, okay, we're going to take this resistance on balance measurement and make it a requirement for existing categories. So it's like, you know, just Cat six for example. Cat six has been defined for what 12 15 years or something yeah, like that a lot longer than people and, realize and it is it is what it is those are the specs that are in the book um and it, in my mind it's like well you can't just go and change what it means to be cat 6 compliant um but this this uh, update to the 568.0 is uh, essentially just that um so the primary reason in the last time we talked we talked about poe and what kind of got us together on that previous um yeah heat meeting. conduction on poe when i was uh you reached you out using a little 26 really gauge cables. 26 yeah. gauge patch cords and so you know poe being such a big interest one of the things on the cabling the vendor side is is so many customers are asking is my cable uh will it support high power poe you know the, the old poe either 2.3 AF and AT, which is like 15 and 25 Watts, you know, that's not a lot of power, uh, but the new BT standard goes up to 90 Watts. And you want to know, does their new cabling support that? And what about their old cabling? Um, so that's where we kind of got into this. And the, if anyone's messed or messed with installed, uh you know a good cat 6 or cat 6a cable you know the first thing you you notice is the conductor size is larger than your 5e yeah uh, that's for higher signal frequencies for both insertion loss and resistance so the this resistance unbalance measurement uh with this new standard 
when it when we um, it, it basically makes that measurement a requirement for 5e6 6a and cat 8 cabling so where this measurement was purely optional it's now a requirement and what that means is if you're installing and, and using a certifier and certifying any new cabling that's cat 5e or above it's it needs to uh, comply with resistance unbalance specs in order to pass certification. What that offers the user is it, it ensures that that cabling will support high power PoE. That's basically what it's doing. So whereas before it was an optional test, now it becomes a requirement. Now, will this require firmware updates for cable certifiers or new versions of their um, devices? Great question. So there are uh, two, there, there's two, I'm gonna say two and a half certifiers that can do this measurement. So you cannot, uh, if it's a hardware measurement, so you can't add software to ah. incorporate this feature. Okay. Um, we did, and then let me explain at a high level what the measurement is. Um, so we've done resistance or loop resistance. So you may have seen that measurement in a tester and that, you know, if you have your two wires, uh, maybe this is a good time for me to, to share a screen and sketch sure. what I'm talking about here. Um, so if you have two wires, uh, that'd be a cable. And uh, the loop resistance measurement, which we've had for a long time, you have, you know, oops. Get, so you've got, you know, your two wires in a pair. And uh, for the case of resistance, one's going to be plus, one's minus. So we, we measure the resistance going down and back as the name loop resistance might imply. Uh, for resistance unbalance, if you take that same pair of cable, there's two resistance unbalance measurements we do. So one is the resistance unbalance within the pair. So we measure this one conductor. So let's say uh, in this top one, and one should be solid, one should be striped. Let's just say it's 20.0. Ohm. So we measure that conductor, but we also measure the second conductor by itself. So let's say it's 20.1 ohms. And that would be okay. Um, so we're allowed to have about two tenths of a difference. So you could have 20.2, uh, uh, but if it was 20.3, oops, that would be, that would be bad. Uh, and the other measurement would be if we have, let's say our orange pair, and then we have our green pair, um, we're gonna measure the resistance. We're gonna tie these two together. So we're gonna take that resistance and let's just, I'll use nice round numbers again. Let's say that's 20.0 ohms, the, the resistance of those two tied together, and we'll tie the resistance of these two together. And I'll just use the same numbers to keep it easy. Uh, let's say it's 20.2 ohms. Okay, so this this one over here on the left is um, our unbalance within a pair. And this one over here is our unbalance between pairs. So we and we do this for all four pairs in the cable. So and I can see where this at a higher wattage probably can cause some problems with uh, devices if you because yep. some of the pairs are going to be different. So I understand the test. That makes complete sense. Exactly. You're exactly right. So we, we call this series, the suite of tests, DCRU, DC resistance unbalance. And you're exactly right in that the, um, the problem is heat buildup in your uh, power supplies. So when the, because there's a transformer in the supplies, it's taking that DC power and coupling it through to the cable. Um, and if that, if the resistance of those cables of the pairs or the conductors in the pair is out of balance or is too different from another, you get heat buildup and it can be in the equipment. So the power supplies themselves will get hotter or the, you know, inside your switch, you have each switch port has a little power supply that's going to get hotter and that can decrease the service life of the equipment because the increased heat. Uh, the other thing that can happen is you can actually get heat buildup in the cable itself. So along that length of the cable, if the resistance is not balanced, you will get heat in the cable. It will increase the temperature of the cable. And uh, it's probably not too bad in Detroit, but if you live in the South or 
you know, you're in a yeah. part of the world in the, in the desert or something like that. And you've got cables up installed in the ceiling where it's, you know, 130 degrees or something in the summer. And the cable also builds up heat from this resistance on balance that increases the attenuation in the wire itself. So you can have a situation where the uh, under PoE, again, if you're using um, high power PoE, you can have a length of cabling that if it's cool, works, you know, let's say it's 100 meters, it's a really long channel and you're running, um, or it's, maybe it's even 40, 40 meters uh, and you're running 10 gig on it. Uh, but if it's hot, all of a sudden you start getting packet errors and, you know, drop frames and things like that. And that can be the, um, because you're at the, you're at the maximum length of that cabling, you start to get heat build up in there, the attenuation increases and you start getting, you know, poor signal to noise ratio and dropping frames. So it affects both power delivery and um, signal integrity, I guess is probably the easiest way to put it. Yeah. So, I mean, it's definitely going to be really important for people that want to run these higher wattage options. They're just yes. going to have to do that, so to speak. So how do you measure it? Um, you can uh, buy a new certifier. <laughs> so if the one you <laughs> well, that's have- so, That's a simple solution. That's an easy solution. <laughs> if the one you have doesn't support it, uh, you can buy a new certifier. Now we are, uh, so we have a, our current model and I'm not pitching products, but just to show yeah. you. Uh, is a Landtech 4 is our current cable certifier, which has this built in, you know, from the scratch, we had this hardware built in because we knew we needed to do it. Um, but our previous product, the Landtech 3, you know, it's, if this test was optional, it would be a different story, but it's mandatory. So um, what we're actually going to be doing is developing new test heads that you could buy and add to the tester. So the actual test head itself is going to do the measurement, this resistance unbalanced measurement, and then communicate those results through to the certifier. So Got it. It, it is, it's a hardware upgrade, um, which would of course have a, a software update to, to go with it. Um, yeah. But that's a way you can get your older certifier to comply with this. Now, not all companies do that. There's other certifiers that are um, different color than us where the only option is to buy a new one. So, but yeah. that it's, you know, it's one of those things where uh, the technology is moving on, you know, POE is, is, is an important thing and we need to ensure that it works. And the cabling vendors uh, put, give these very long warranties on their systems. So it's just another uh, thing they need to, to do to ensure that it's going to deliver what it says it does under all installation and conditions and environments. So that's, uh, that's resistance and balance. I think, you know, we can, I don't know how much more detail we need to go into it. Was I, the explanation I, clear as to what it does? Yeah, absolutely. I understand it uh, much better. And I made sure because you started talking about before we started the recording, I'm like, no, oh, no, we got to explain it to Tom. Cause I, I did not read up in detail on that particular thing. <laughs> <laughs> I completely, and I hope the audience does too, have a pretty clear understanding of it and, and why it's important. You know, yeah. and it, it even makes me think by weird coincidence today, a couple people are posting on Twitter. They were showing the um, burnt out electrical, so not electrical sockets, but the uh, contacts on some yes. RJ45s that looked burnt over time. They said, hey, this POE seems to be overheating. And, you know, people what are it, speculating about What that about actually it. is, um, I can't visually explain it, but you have the, the, the socket in the plug, right? Yeah. And it's arcing under load and actually in the, in the POE specs, um, in the new standard, we have specifications for the connectors that under full power, so the arcing occurs when you break the connection. So yeah. when you when you make the connection, there's no PoE, right? Because you, when you hook it- Because it negotiates it, up to the standard. Got it, it has to negotiate. So it's a, from a data or a power standpoint, it's dead. But if it's under load and you just pull the plug, you're going to get an arc. And of course that carbon- uh, Will build up. Can build up. So some manufacturers have, and there's really going to be difficult for me to show this, but where the, you know, imagine my thumb is bent and I'm the, the pin inside yeah. of the <laughs> jack. Okay. And here comes the plug. Um, what they'll do is sort of have a sacrificial surface there. Ah. And so let's say my fingertip is really the important part. That's where the, the data connection is and it connects there. And then when you pull the plug, the way they build it is that the, the tip comes. So the data parts 
disconnected in the load drops. and then you break that second part so this this part here is not important it's sacrificial right so they design the contacts like that um, that's clever yeah to survive it's so there's something you're probably not going to find in the in the lowest budget of poe switches but the higher end stuff <laughs> no yeah the higher end switches and i guess where it's probably um you know yeah in, in your equipment you can't do anything about it but at least in the in the wall outlets and if you're disconnecting patch cords yeah um you know that that connector your your cabling system is going to survive many many hundreds of disconnects under full yeah. power but it's interesting that you said people are seeing that because you know we look at it as well we're gonna put this in the spec and design for it but it's you know it's gonna happen but people probably won't notice it so i'm, I'm really interested that you know you have someone yeah that's seen it, it was a world. weird discussion because someone said hey why does this happen and it was little it looked like little marks on it that was uh, the person said it was poe and i'm like well, that is interesting why is it doing that so <laughs> yeah i mean if you, you search i don't want to mention vendors but you can see some of the vendors that that have designed these plugs like that they'll show they have pictures you know high magnification photos of of the contacts and the damage that occurs so it's something you can you know people yeah. can google and find that definitely just to see um so the the other let's see the other thing i wanted to talk about and we single can go, pair ethernet single pair ethernet you're hot on that one <laughs> I, that one just sounds really cool um because there's less wires uh, and i've also used in the past and probably unrelated so to speak but the devices that take old phone lines for example to convert them to data lines it requires special devices at each end but now this is going to be come to more to the mainstream with this it sounds like yeah, so the, the new standard is the, if you're familiar or not familiar with the standards um, in the TIA world, it's the 568.5. Um, so that's the group of standards that encompasses single pair ethernet. And it's pretty much as straightforward as it sounds. It is one pair of conductors inside of a cable jacket. Um, the primary use case for it is uh, sensors, and my least favorite word in industry right now, IoT devices. So it's to support those. Um, but the advantage, there's a couple of advantages. So one is it's small. So when you have, and, and the one thing I forgot to mention to you before is, so the cable is obviously small because it's one pair inside a jacket. But okay, there's a, so if you have a small cable, but you go into an RJ45, well, so what, what's the advantage? So we wanna get more density on the equipment and the panels. There's also a new connector um, that goes along with this, which is a one pair connector. And, and there's, um, there's about, there's four different ones that you can use, but one is a, there's one type that's an unshielded connector used primarily for indoors. And the other three are a sealed uh, industrial type connector. But the, what's really cool is the, the primary one for unshielded indoor cabling, it, it looks just like an LC fiber connector. And it's the, oh, same, okay. it's the same size and shape. The body is literally an LC connector, but instead of having the, the one fiber ferrule right yeah. in the middle, um, you've got, I'll make it bigger. You've got the, you know, the, the business end of the connector and you have two kind of diagonal offset copper pins um, for your for the conductor of each year. So it, it looks like an LC, obviously it's smaller than an RJ45. So now you have small cable, small connectors, so you can get a lot more high density cabling. Um, and this might be a neat idea. I, I can picture like a good low bandwidth use case would be like door access systems. They don't need a lot of data, they do need power. Yep. And uh, this seems like a simplification to run those uh, like Ac that. Yes, access control, environmental control systems uh, in the industrial market. You know, you uh, imagine a bottling plant where they're bottling, you know, soda or beer, and all of those, you know, devices in that plant um, have controls, and they don't need four pairs. I mean, it's it, it's very low bandwidth. It's saying the command to open the door, close the door, yeah. turn the pump on, turn the pump off, you know, turn on the HVAC, whatever it is. So. Um, so there's a few different specs for this, or, or two different specs, I shouldn't say a few, um, as far as distance and bandwidth. So one is one gig at 40 meters, which at first doesn't sound impressive, but remember this is on one pair, okay? yeah, not four pairs. And then the other one is 10 meg at one kilometer. So that's 3,200 feet. Uh, so quite, quite a big distance. And uh, for that's... Minutes. 
and that's plenty for, you know, so we deal with here in Detroit, a lot of manufacturing companies and, you know, they do have large warehouses, but they just need, so like you said, some type of sensor data. Is this machine running? What's the status? What, how many RPMs is it doing? Not high yeah, bandwidth. <laughs> exactly. And imagine, uh, especially in thinking things like big distribution centers where you've got people walking around with scan guns. I mean, that's not a bunch of data, right? It's just whoop, mm-hmm. scan the barcode and, and the system, you know, yeah. logs it. So another lot of applications um, that we could see now. I don't, there's the, like a lot of the cases, there's always, one always precedes the other. Either the equipment comes out before the standards, or in this case, we have the standard and the cabling, you know, coming to market before the equipment. So there's, you know, we're waiting for the adoption to make, so you're not, you're not seeing like single pair switches. If you go online right now, you're not going to find a, single pair ethernet switch right. well, maybe in the industrial side because the the ieee standards have been out for a while to support this for automotive actually so the first people to really implement single pair ethernet was the automotive industry um so that's kind of just been used i don't want to speak too much you know out of it be too inaccurate but just to make it simple we took what was being used in automotive for single pair and just adopted it to building cabling and supporting longer distance. So the, the automotive one, they're using the, the one gig 40 meter. Um, and again, that's for um, cameras, uh, all, all the sensors, you know, all the, all the stuff you have on your cars these days, yeah. it's all, you know, it's basically a big rolling network. Um, oh yeah. I've dabbled a little bit in car hacking and CAN bus and taking it apart. It's oh, interesting for sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm working with a company that makes big, um, earth moving and mining equipment and things like that. And they are, you know, they're deploying this in their vehicles because of all of the cameras and sensors. So imagine if you got a giant, you know, I don't even know how, how much away, 50 ton, you oh, know, track yeah, those thing machines that's hauling, are you know, in a unreal. mine. Yeah. You don't want to, you don't want to run over some guy, you know, so they've got cameras all around <laughs> these things and they're automated. Uh, I'm getting off topic here, but it's cool. Like the next time I go up there, they promised me I could remotely control like an excavator or an earth mover or something. Well, that's exciting. Uh, I'm and, all over that. <laughs> and to bring us back on topic, someone might be asking the question with single pair thin it. Well, you still got to get power to these sensors, but yes. that's where single pair POE essentially comes over. Yeah. So we, we don't call it POE. Uh, we call it poodle, um, uh, P O D L it's big P little O big D, uh, big L. So that's power over data okay. line. And it is, it's like POE, but over a single pair. So one conductor is, is positive on the other conductor is negative. So in your regular POE, like for example, your, your orange pair will both be negative and your green pair will both be positive. Um, that's traditional POE, but in Poodle, it's one conductor is positive and the other is negative. So yeah, we've got, we're going to support sensors and IoT devices and give them power through the network. So it's, um, it's really been, it's probably one of the fastest implementations I've seen. Normally standards organizations take forever and it's really, uh, gosh, it's, I think it's been two years that we've been working on it. Um, yeah, it was probably February of 2019 was the first meeting we had. I remember it was a standards meeting in Orlando and it was the when we you know, really started getting serious about it. Okay, are we gonna adopt a uh, single pair? Are we gonna start working on it? What about connectors? And you know, we had a bunch of like, it was really kind of cool. You had a lot of the connector manufacturers submitting designs and then passing around like 3D printed samples and we all voted on, okay, which connector do we want to, you know, pick and standardize and move forward with. So, um, so it's cool. I'm excited to see how it goes. Obviously with testing, you know, being a tester equipment manufacturer, there's going to be different tests um, we do on it. So, uh, you know, your test, your typical certifier uh, with, with that would be a software upgrade, but you do need a new adapter to connect to this new single pair connector. Um, but as far as most testers are concerned, it should be a software update where with the new adapter, you just say, okay, I'm going to test, you know, return loss, insertion loss. Uh, we don't do next. We don't do crosstalk on it because it's just one pair, but we do alien crosstalk. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Um, so alien crosstalk was a spec we worked on for cat six a, 
um, and not to dive down too much down that rabbit hole, but one of the um, key issues with Cat 6A and 10, well, 10 gigs specifically, is high frequencies and you get crosstalk between the different cables in the bundle. Um, so that's alien crosstalk, crosstalk between cables. So in single pair ethernet, we also have concerns with alien crosstalk. Um, so you'll have you know, one, one pair um, that you're measuring with a tester, but you might also connect that tester because a tester can measure four pairs at a time. So you might have one pair that's called the victim and three other ones you can measure at the same time that are at the disturber. So that's a new measurement um, we'll probably see in, in um, single pair ethernet testing. So we're working on that standard. We have uh, TIA and ISO meetings coming up in February where we're gonna hammer the rest of this stuff out. And um, I think we're voting on draft two of it and TIA, so it's getting pretty close. I would say nice. it might be a finalized spec in six, you know, four to six months time and then uh, a little round of voting. So probably by the fall, um, maybe even the summer, we might have a, a, you know, ratified spec for single pair. That is relatively fast. <laughs> it is. I mean, for us, it's, it's, it's a really uh, quick push through. And, you know, we hope to see manufacturers, equipment manufacturers supporting it. Um, you know, so well, of course, you can run any application, anything that you can run over a pair of wires. So if for your traditional access control system, um, you know, if you in industrial stuff, if you can run it over one pair of cat three, you can, you know, certainly run it over a, a pair. And by the way, the, the, um, the frequency range so the categories of this, uh, it's still a little bit in flux, but 20 megahertz is, is going to be the, the low end of the frequency range. Um, up to was it a hundred, I think it's like 20 and then 100 megahertz. I should know this. I just, it escapes me right now. So it's fairly low frequency. Um, and that's what helps us get the distance so that the one kilometer reach is the lower frequency, the 20 megahertz um, system. And that's what gives you the 10 megabits per second. So it's a, a lower frequency, which lets us get more reach at a lower uh, bit rate. Huh. Um, so, so it's 20 and 40 are the two different bandwidths it runs at, you said? Uh, sorry, 20, uh, 20 megahertz and 100 megahertz. Oh, okay. Uh, so the 20 megahertz is the one kilometer, 10 okay. megabit, and the 100 megahertz is the one gig, uh, 40 meters. So there's a lot of numbers here. So uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I should have I written this down on a slide or something like that. I can make some Well, and once the standard's right. published, we'll absolutely know in writing. So <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And I have, I have a draft. It's, you know what, it's, we're still, I'm still coming off this Christmas break, you know? Break yeah, yeah. Back to work. <laughs> exactly. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to talk about, and this is something that comes up all the time, um, are measurements uh, called TCL and ELTCL. And I'm going to uh, write, I'm going to share my screen again and, and write this down because this, this is a fun one. Because um, we talked about TCL, what is ELTCL? Yeah. So TCL, am I sharing? Yes. This is um, transverse conversion loss. And the other is ELTCTL. And that's equal level transverse uh, conversion transfer loss. Definitely a mouthful, yeah? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, and pardon my chicken scratch, but I'm a, a left-handed left engineer, so, you know, that's, that's <laughs> how it goes. Um, these measurements are fundamentally a way to measure uh, how well the twist, I'm going to just make it really basic, how well the in the consistency of the twist in your cable is. Um, <clears throat> so when we talk about twisting of the pairs in our cable, um, I think we generally know, okay, that helps crosstalk. It minimizes uh, interference. And so the real reason that we do, that we twist the pairs 
is not that it rejects noise, um, external noise, is what the twisting does is make sure that any noise that comes in is the, is the same on both conductors in a pair. Uh, the signaling that we use in Ethernet is called differential signaling. So, you know, on a pair, you have a plus and a minus, and there's uh, equal and opposite voltages. So you'll have a pulse that's, you know, plus five volts and minus five volts. Um, so going back to my little sketchboard here and just move move it out of the way okay so let's say you have a pair here and you have a plus and a minus and we'll say that there's a pulse on this line that's you know some amplitude plus and minus um and we'll just call that plus 2.5 volts and minus 2.5 volts don't worry i'm not going to go all crazy on you here <laughs> um the receiver at the end is a differential receiver so it subtracts these two together. It doesn't add them because if you add this plus two and a half and you add it to minus two and a half, you get zero. You don't right. want zero pulls. So what you end up with is 2.5 minus a negative 2.5 and that equals plus five volts. So that comes out to plus five. So it's a subtraction. Now, here's the, here's the magic part of it. So let's say that you have this pulse coming down and you run it next to some equipment here that's generating bad, you know, EMF or RFI, whatever you want to call it. And it's and it's putting noise on the cable right here. And let's just say that is a uh, one volt noise spike. So now your data pulse as it travels by that spot right there if it's plus one volt then this is going to be plus uh 3.5 volts and this negative 2.5 is now going to be minus and i'll just color these in to make it clear minus 1.5 okay you add the or you sorry add you subtract those together, three and a half minus a negative one and a half is still five volts. Ah. So you still get your five volt pulse at the end because this noise, uh, the noise here was uh, imparted equally on both those conductors. And the only way that works now is that the conductors are really tightly twisted. So when that, when that signal passes by that noise, it's, it's imparted equally on both of those. Now, if you have cable, and I'll draw, let me just scoot this up, up a little bit. Let's say you have cable where, you know, the, this is a really bad drawing, but the twist- <laughs> did, yeah. It's not twisted properly. <laughs> it's, not, it's not twisted well. There's gaps between the conductors. Uh, usually the cause of that's gonna be uh, low cost cable that's not twisted very well or you can get it where you know if you if you take a pair of wires and you and you kink it or bend it you'll see that they could separate the two conductors yeah. will separate from each other the tighter the twist the less they're going to separate so let's say in the same example you have this you know one volt bad signal coming in here and it happens to hit a part of the cable where these pulses are these the conductors are not um, equal or not twisted tightly together. And so maybe, you know, again, just as a reminder, we have, we're bringing in uh, plus two and a half and minus two and a half here. But let's say we pass this point where the cables are split apart for some reason. And, and this is our plus one. So here we're going to get our uh, plus 3.5. But if this guy is positioned such that maybe it doesn't get uh, much of that voltage impulse, let's say, let's say for whatever reason that it only gets a, a half a volt. So this is not a big deal here, but that's gonna make it uh, minus two volts. And so now when you subtract them at the other end, you're gonna end up with um, 
five and a half volts. Um, that pulse coming out the other side. Now that's an example where it's not too bad, um, but you can have any, you know, you can just start playing with these numbers here and you can get to a point where the voltage is getting so low that the receiver essentially can't pick it up. So in this case I drew here, it was happened to be that the voltage went up, um, but I could just change the numbers a little bit and you can have and it go down. Control. The same problem yeah. occurs. It's unbalanced and occurs. out of spec. Yeah. So what TCL does, so normal cable certifier um, only measures between pairs. A normal cable certifier or any tester really doesn't uh, measure on a per conductor basis. So what the TCL measurement is looking at these two conductors, okay? And it's looking to see how well, how consistent I'll say the twist rate is between those two conductors. Um, the term we use in the signaling is, is that it's a differential to, um, it's a differential mode measurement where we're measuring the difference in these signals relative to each other in the same pair. And that's a whole lot of gibberish. I know it sounds like it. Uh, versus this cable down here, the tester in this TCL measurement would actually see the physical, it can sort of measure the physical separation of the pairs, but doing it in an electrical manner. Is that, maybe that's yeah. probably the best explanation. Of it's measuring the physical consistency or separation of the pairs in an electrical manner. So that's all TCL is. Um, the, the EL, TCTL, is essentially measuring, it's like we have crosstalk and then we have uh, ACRF, which is crosstalk from the other end of the cable. So TCL um, is going to just measure looking in just at the one end of the cable. Um, EL, TCTL is essentially saying, we're gonna transmit a signal from that end and we're going to measure. So with TCL, we're both transmitting on, let me do this. Let's say we're transmitting on that guy and receiving on that guy. Um, with EL, TCTL, we're transmitting on uh, this conductor and receiving on the other conductor at the far end of the cable. So that's all the difference between that, the one that's a real mouthful all it's saying is that we're transmitting on one conductor at one end and listening on the other conductor at the other end, okay? TCL is we're transmitting on one conductor at one end and listening on the other conductor at the same end. So that's the difference in measurements. Um, and what it's gonna do again is, is help us uh, determine really how good the cable is twisted together. Now, why is this important? Noise, so in commercial environments, it's probably not a huge deal. Um, you know, we generally don't see a lot of problems with people running things next to power sources. And it used to be the old worry was keep your cabling away from your fluorescent light fixtures. You know? Yes. <laughs> uh, it's not, it's, you know, we got to be wary of that, but it's not a huge deal. Um, but in the industrial environment and in factories, so if you're dealing with customers that have, that are putting stuff in plants where you have all these machines and robots and things like that, making a lot of electrical and um, EMI and RFI noise, that's where this becomes particularly important. Yeah, and those industrial plants are absolutely as noisy as possible when it comes to EMF, so. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, so this, and this is something that it's, it's kind of cool and I like it because, uh, you know, for years we've always had to explain that uh, crosstalk is not a measurement of external noise. And I've, you know, I tell people, you, you know, they're, they'll say, I've certified my cable and it passes, but why is it when I try to run it, I'm getting, you know, data errors and drop frames and things like that. And they'll say, but it passes the test. And if it's, if the problem is coming from external noise, it's because the certification test um, is only looking at the, uh, the difference in pairs and, and how that affects crosstalk from one pair to another, it doesn't have any relevance on external noise coming into the cable. So this is really the first measurement that we've done with certifiers on cable that is a, a 
fundamental measurement of how well the cable can reject external noise. And it's hard to believe, but up till now, that hasn't been a, a big concern for us. So I'm, I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now. Yeah, that, I mean, it's interesting. And like you said, there's some good, strong points to do this with in industrial applications and things like that. And we've run into some weird uh, problems over time, uh, especially because if you're familiar with the way bus bars work and things like that in some of the shops, I mean, yeah. you got to get, we've seen cable laid right on top of the bus bars for like, no, oh no, this is because especially because the, the way bus bar works industrial, some of those, I think are all 480s. I mean, they're, uh-huh. I, I don't, I don't, I'm shocked that people just lay cable across them. Oh like, my God. That's, a, I, I that's like, get anywhere near that. yeah. yeah, I don't want to even be by it. <laughs> that, that's something that makes your hair stand up a little bit. Just thinking about it. Yeah. Um, 120 Hertz, 240 might hurt a lot. Uh, 480, you don't come back from. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. The, the, um, the, this also applies to single pair. So we, with single pair, we marry, you know, we have, um, Actually, we do resistance and balance with single pair as well. So single pair, we have resistance and balance and TCL uh, going into this new cabling, new connectors. So it's, it's really a whole uh, kind of game changer as far as, um, you, you know, a, a, it's the first time in, in, since I've been in the industry that we've had a sort of a whole new copper form factor. Um, with copper, we've just been trying to get more data down at using those four pairs. Uh, making the cable thicker and all that stuff. And here's sort of a reverse of let's make things nice and small. So you can get, you know, bundles of cables where you might have these su- supporting, you know, a whole bunch of sensors or access control devices and, and shrinking that down and standardizing it because in the access control and alarm, you know, again, all security systems. That's a, yeah. That's an issue. You need some standardized. Yeah. You got people using, you know, twist terminals and screw terminal blocks and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, getting some formal connectors and things to really try to structure that, that type of cabling environment is really what this new standard is focused at. I like it. All right. Cool. So those were, those were the three things I wanted to drop on you and, uh, just let you know what's coming down. There's, uh, maybe next time we can talk about fiber cause there's a whole bunch of new stuff with, with fiber. Um, yeah, that's, I think that's a, a definitely going to be an interesting talk. So uh, fiber coming up and uh, letting us know how these standards are, are coming along. There'll be some updates on that. This is, uh, it's been a fun yeah, deep look, dive look in forward. that. I would say uh, we're going to, again, we're having meetings coming up soon and we've been going through draft votes. So a lot of this stuff should be uh, the single pair one was probably going to be finalized. Like I said, probably this fall um, if we're lucky. So, uh, you know, I would say, keep your eyes out if you're just, you know, looking at your equipment suppliers and all that. I'm just curious to see if people are looking at implementing single pair. I think that it'll realistically, it's going to be a couple of years before it really gets some traction, you know, out of the field, but at least we want to make sure we have the infrastructure available to support it. Cause you know, you hate when a new technology comes out and the cabling and the infrastructure and, and the rules don't exist to deploy it properly. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like we can hang on to those cable certifiers maybe a little bit longer. <laughs> yes. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. You don't have Unless to, you're running the you know, 90 watt POE, then well, you got to certify well, for that. And the other, the other thing is, you know, I think this is maybe the little tester I sent to you last time. So well, yep. the screen is, is getting wiped out on my background. Yeah. Here. There we go. Yep. That's the um, one we have. Yeah. But something, something like this is, uh, will tell you it's not a certifier, but it will, uh, it actually measures a live POE circuit. Yes, and measures the voltage. Voltage drop tells you how much power you're actually getting. Um, so you know that yep. that's an easy way to do it. It's not a certifier, but it's a real world test to make. Yeah, sure it, it gives you, and you can see some of the loss. We were actually um, just doing some testing with that in a video I did about uh, 10 gig and those little SFP plus adapters. Yeah, I saw that video. Yeah, so because they they create their own challenges, and uh, it started is because a lot of people don't realize they don't the SFP plus a RJ45 adapter modules, those transceivers don't necessarily run the full expected length of a uh, cable. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that because um, for a new product that we're launching soon, I was just, per, you know, in the market for some SFP transceivers, SFP plus 10 gig, and I bought some fiber ones. And um, I happened to look at, watch that video of yours pretty much the same day or the day before I was looking for copper ones. And 
I didn't realize that, that there's a lot that are only 30 meters. Yeah. Instead of uh, the full 40 meters or, or some of them will even go farther, but or hundred meters, sorry. So there's some that are 30 versus hundred and there's a pretty big price difference between those. Yeah. Uh, I think almost at least double, maybe triple. I was seeing yep. uh, some of the, yeah, you can pick up the, the ones that are 30 meters that have been out for a little while. I think some of those are in the 20 and $30 range versus I think I paid like 32 bucks for one. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's uh, it was partly because I have a lot of people who, you know, build out small home labs and they probably wouldn't notice as much until they try to run it across further away. Um, because a lot of times in more production environments, we're buying the switches that have 10 gig native built into them because yeah. we, uh, it is a higher cost, but you know, occasionally we have used those because it's a quick solution when you have some SFE ports. So, yeah. 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 Um, so when, yeah, when that, when we get a little further down the road, maybe I'll, I'll give you a holler back and see if we can talk about some of the fiber stuff. Cause absolutely. Lot, I, lot I, I know that I certainly have an audience for the fiber stuff as well. Um, that's a, that's going to be a long discussion for sure. Cause there's a lot going into the different fiber standards. <laughs> there is absolutely. All right. Well, thanks. And uh, I'll leave a link to the previous video where we talk about the other cabling standards. Cause I, I kind of want to rewatch it myself. Cause man, there was so many good details. That's my go-to reply. When people <laughs> argue with me about cabling standards, I'm like, Oh, I might be wrong, but I don't think Dan's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I appreciate it. I, I, that's very kind. <laughs> All right. Take care. Please thanks. Tell. All right. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general. Even suggestions for new videos, they're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.